possible for the people, since governments are very ineffective, for the people to set up trusts in order to set targets to ensure the sustainability of the global commons. That's what we want to discuss, uh, and we couldn't have anyone better here than James uh, Quilligan, uh, who is um, a distinguished philosopher, I think a pragmatic economist, uh, and a world leader as a theorist and campaigner on behalf of the Global Commons. He is the Chairman of, for the Secretariat of the Global Commons Trust, Managing Director of the Centre uh, for Global Negotiations. He has served as policy advisor and writer uh, for many international politicians, so he's very familiar with that world, uh, including Pierre Trudeau, Francois Mitron, Edward Heath, Willie Brandt, Jimmy Carter, and I hope very much, very soon, Francois Hollande, uh, <laughs> after his wonderful victory uh, at the uh, weekend. And also as an e economic consultant for government agencies across the world. There could be no better person to introduce this subject, and we're very honoured to have with us James Quilligan. Mm. Thank you. It was another introduction first, if we may. All right, so um, I'm Anna, I'm from the School of Commoning, and uh, the, school, yeah, the School of Commoning is actually the anniversary is tomorrow. So the first anniversary of the founding of the School of Commoning happens to be tomorrow. Right. So we are celebrating the School of Commoning first year in the House of Commons, and maybe in the future the House of Commoning. <laughs> <laughs> So the School of Commoning is um, CIC. We are a social enterprise and our focus is on educating for the commons and social renewal. We work, although we are based in London, uh, we work locally and globally. And we work with online and local communities. So we are very keen to um, help to raise awareness about the commons and about commoning because Commons cannot exist without the activity of commoning. I began to discover the commons during the, the common heritage movement in the 1970s, which was a big deal at that time. But it was driven not by civil society as much as it was driven by developing countries who at the time wanted to claim uh, natural resources for themselves. And it had a self-interest behind it. So the common heritage movement of the 1970s eventually fizzled out. But what's re-emerged now is a very vibrant movement coming from the grassroots. And it's a, a celebration of uh, traditional commons, like forests and rivers and streams, and the, the kinds of things we know as natural resources, but also the immaterial commons, which are not land and not natural resources. The electric magnetic spectrum, the internet, the uh, solar energy, these are not coming from the earth. These are coming from wavelengths, physics, that, are, that transcend the earth. But there are new emerging commons. They're very important to track and very important to, to uh, integrate with our <coughs> classical economic forms. But these are emerging forms of the commons that need to be included in a new economic philosophy. I would like to remind you about the meaning of the word commons. In the beginning was the commons. People hunted and gathered on the common to meet their needs. Like all species, Human beings inhabited familiar territories in their vicinity, but these were communal to their family or, or their tribe, not owned by particular persons. People took the commons for granted because there was no reason not to. Yes, many, many times people fought over their spaces, but for the most part, each person shared their own little corner of the world with friends and family. We would not be here today if our ancestors had not shared their commons and destroyed themselves. It's their legacy. We are their legacy, actually. The commons were simply, for them, the economics of human need and replenishment. That's in ancient times. And eventually, in areas like Egypt and Persia and Phoenicia, and Carthage and Greece, a small private or, or business sphere began to evolve alongside a larger public or governmental sphere. By the time of ancient Rome, society was becoming differentiated between private, public, and commons interests. 
In the face of these private and governmental sectors, the commons needed legal justification to remain relevant. The Roman Justinian Code of 533 AD declared, the law of nature is that which she has taught all animals, a law not peculiar to the human race, but shared by all living creatures, whether denizens of the air, the dry land, or the sea. King John signed the Magna Carta in 1215, and two years after that, the Charter of the Forest was signed by his son, King Henry III. It declared the royal forest as common land, which could be enjoyed and used by all citizens, including serfs and vassals. But during the 16th and 17th centuries, the English commons began to be privatized or enclosed. These enclosures began with the common meadows that were used for hay, the common land used to graze livestock, and the arable farmland used to grow food. By the late 19th century, after 4,000 acts of parliament, over 98% of the agricultural land in England and Wales was owned by less than 1% of the population. During the past several centuries, the privatization of common land has become a familiar story across the world. What happens when private owners are granted legal titles to common properties and enclosure becomes a primary driver of wealth creation in the world economy? Let's make a very brief review of the enclosure of the commons. Commoners are forcibly displaced from the forests and streams and fields they had once considered inalienable through customary law. Commodities become detached from their real value as gifts that are beyond price. The personal use value of things is transformed into commercial exchange value. Cooperation, altruism, and mutuality are displaced by reciprocity, calculation, and utility. The state emerges to protect private property and defend the homeland through legally sanctioned violence against those who would challenge private ownership. Civil law replaces customary law or moral law. The world becomes increasingly mechanical and decontextualized. Access to nature is restricted. Society is divided into creditors and debtors. Exchange takes place through a currency based on bank debt. Interest charges promote competition and encourage perpetual growth. Commercial exchange expands. Alienability becomes marketability. Common faith and community bonds deteriorate. The significance of tradition and culture is diminished. Morality and natural law become a matter of self-interest and personal choice. Material wealth and poverty exist side by side. The commons is no longer the economics of sufficiency and replenishment. The commons is now the economics of scarcity and consumption. Today, we vaguely recall this social history of the enclosures of the commons. But how were these developments rationalized by science, political science, and economic theory? In classical physics and chemistry, systems were regarded as the sum of their component parts. Applying this principle to human beings, philosopher John Locke viewed the person as a mental substance and the body as its material property. The mind owns the body. And just as the mind owns the body, the person owns property. That was the analogy he made. This created a kind of atomism or reductionism in liberal social thinking, where individuals are thought to be comp uh, comprised of preferences and assets. Enlightenment thinkers began to teach that these preferences and assets are in constant interchange among people through their social relationships. They applied this liberal version of metaphysics to the liberal vision of society. In the political sphere, the mind of government through policies and institutions coordinates the body politic through votes and taxes. Similarly, economics is conceived as a mechanistic system. The minds of producers coordinate the supply of property and material resources to meet the demand of consumers' bodies through their utility and happiness. This should sound familiar 
because it's the basis of today's consumer society. We consume what we need. But the economics of human need has failed us. By focusing on consumption, economics has neglected the rest of the cycle. We consume what we need, but this also means that we consume to be replenished. Yes, as individuals, we are replenishing ourselves through consumption. But individual consumption is not replenishing society. And individual consumption is not replenishing nature. This is the legacy of the enclosure of the commons. For generations, our resources have been under assault from global market forces, regional and national policy development, and inadequate legal recognition of common property rights. We're drilling for oil in the oceans, releasing vast amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. We're patenting the genes and seeds necessary for curing diseases and for nourishment. We're privatizing water and claiming these seeds and other genetic resources as intellectual property. The private sector now penetrates segments of society that we had previously considered off limits to commercial interests. Public education, scientific research, philanthropy, art, health, health care, prisoner rehabilitation, roads, bridges, have all ceased to be public or common spaces, but are now, many of them, are under private control. Why? Because this is an expression of individual freedom and creates economic growth. We're told that we're being old-fashioned if we cling to the commons of the past, since modern society advances only through growth. Yet, we are recognizing that the benefits of perpetual economic growth are not compensating for the vast damages and risks they create from social insecurity, global warming, ecological degradation and species loss, to hunger, poverty, debt, and financial meltdown. We're also realizing that neither the private sphere nor government provision and distribution, which created these problems to begin with, are capable of solving them. Business has adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by selling private goods to the individual consumers. Government has adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by regulating and provisioning public goods to individual citizens. But who is responsible for preserving our common goods? Who is responsible for replenishing what is consumed? Who is creating the collective will for sustainability? The economics of human need must be broadened to encompass the sustainability of the commons. But who is creating this new economics of replenishment? Look at our divisive political world. We're divided into ideologies that focus more on social good and ideologies which focus more on individual rights. But all of those who have cha chosen to champion a particular view of either the social good or of individual rights have generated an enormous political polarity. This duality between the ideals of social equality and political freedom discourages personal and social reconciliation, the transformation of our communities and the creation of a commons-based economy. When the individual is set in competition with the whole of society, the moral will and creativity of people are suppressed. Mind and body are seen as separate units. Our being is split from our action. Our common purpose is lost. Western liberalism is in crisis. We have not fully understood that the society which sees itself as an inevitable polarity between the social good and the individual rights destroys the forms of life that are rooted in the commons. Capitalism is failing because it does not recognize the need for creating and maintaining the commons. This has left us starved for the equality and freedom which express the interrelatedness of human life and which can arise only through our commons. Recall that the system of privatization did not begin with Mrs. Thatcher. It began in ancient Rome. If we take the long view of things, one could say that the Roman Empire was never really defeated until the end of World War II with the demise of the Nazi regime. 
Yet, Rome is reviving itself now through the market state. This phenomenon called the market state has been defined by both Philip Bobbitt and Philip Blonde. And while I agree with their choice of words in characterizing it as the market state, I don't agree with the politics of these authors. Nevertheless, I think it describes what is going on better than the word neoliberalism. It's the confluence of business and government that we've been witnessing since the 1970s. Market state describes what seems like a role reversal over the last 40 years between the private and public sectors. Indeed, the business community now has taken up many of the social and cultural responsibilities that were formerly the concern of government, such as policing power, prisons, social problems, environment, personal health, public and adult education, and the fostering of culture through finance. And the state has embraced market dynamics and corporate principles of efficiency and management to a greater degree than before, marginalizing the role of representative government. Where is the voice of non-dualism today? Who is speaking for a genuine third way and not some centrist split of the political right and the political left being called a third way? Unlike the market state, the commons cannot be coordinated by some ultimate authority exercising control through a unified command structure, the social hierarchy of private property, the division of labor, and the enclosure of what belongs to everyone. Rather, the commons expresses the massive heterogeneous force of society and the common responsibility of people to protect and sustain their valuable common goods. Without a sense of the indivisibility of human existence, the modern ideologies of collective rights and individual rights are both devoid of the realization that we take part in a variety of commons which are the sources of our livelihood and well-being. The commons recognize the dichotomy between the individuals as the sum of their desires and ends through the common good and the individual being who is free to make choices independent of those desires and ends as in individual rights. The commons movement brings them together as a consciously organized third sector that can create a more beneficial balance in economics and society. The commons are resources which people self-organize through their own production and governance. These commons involving social, cultural, intellectual, digital, solar, natural, genetic, and material resources are now being rediscovered and rapidly becoming a potent counterforce to the market state. The commons offer a unique form of non-dualism, a way of integrating the individual with the collective, the self with the whole. We are now recognizing that our beloved commons are both the state of individual being and the collective state of the world. But what happens to the liberal ideas of freedom represented by the invisible hand of the market and equality and justice represented by our social contract, contract with government? The self-organization and rule-based production of a commons is a grassroots application of the principles of freedom and equality which are idealized but imperfectly expressed through modern free markets and state-enforced justice. We are expressing freedom and equality far more directly through the commons, through pluralism, subsidiarity, and horizontal decision-making. This new dy social dynamic arising from the shared values and meanings of people's life experiences in the organization and production of their commons includes but transcends the market and state, thus bringing people a new form of political power. People across the world are creating commons trusts and social charters. We're developing new forms of co-production and co-governance. Open source models of self-organization and value creation are inspiring communities in innovative ways. We're learning that the commons are not just the resources but the set of relationships they create, including the communities that use them and the cultural and social practices and property regimes that manage them. Unlike Moses coming down from the mountain with his tablet 
proclaiming the laws of God, there is no prophet of the commons holding a set of immutable principles that we can say are universal laws. Yet, there are some guidelines that many of us are following, which seem to reflect the evolution of human civilization in the 21st century. We are co-creators of nature. By creating this shared environment, we participate in our own culture. Through this creative cooperation, resource users become the producers of their own resources. Cooperation between users and producers is the practice of stewardship. The social and political expression of stewardship is trusteeship. Trusteeship of the commons transforms the ownership structures of society. Co-produced and co-governed commons generate sources of value which transcend the marketplace and government. Commons value is the basis of a debt-free monetary system. A commons-based society results from our collective intentions for sustainability. The economics of the commons is replenishment. What does this mean that the commons is the economics of replenishment? In our present view, we consume what we need. But this economics of human need has failed us. By focusing on consumption, economics has neglected the rest of the cycle. We consume to be replenished. As individuals, we are replenishing ourselves through consumption. But as I said earlier, our consumption is not replenishing society. And it's not replenishing nature. Business has adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by selling private goods to individual consumers. Government has ad adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by regulating and provisioning public goods to individual citizens. But who is responsible preserving, for preserving our common goods? Who is responsible for replenishing what is consumed? Who has created collective intentions for sustainability? Friends, the House of Commons took its name to remind the public that it represents communities, communes. I understand this to be a promise by the government to honor the people and the resources of this nation. It's time that our leaders broaden the economics of human need to encompass the commons, not just in the UK and the Western world, but in all nations. It is our collective responsibility to replenish what we consume. The commons must be created and sustained for the benefit of everyone. The commons will lead to peer-to-peer -peer job creation in which the users of resources become the producers of those resources, creating innovative forms of employment. Now is the time to manifest plenty in our world, to manifest the processes needed to ensure that this planet is used wisely and sustainably so that everyone will get their needs mm -hmm. met today, tomorrow, and hundreds of years from now. The non-dualism of individual rights and social good is teaching us how to rebuild our commons, create collective intentions for the planet based on sustainability, and restore the peace and tranquility of the world. The liberal economics mm -hmm. of consumption has failed us. The commons is the economics of replenishment. Thank you. Well, uh, I think that's uh, the most dramatic, challenging, and forthright uh, statement on the nature of the world uh, and the way it has been perverted uh, that I think I have heard, I can't think when, ever. Uh, it is certainly immensely refreshing uh, compared with the political debates which one has in this House of Commons uh, and it raises our sense of awareness about the nature of our society, the way our civilization has changed and degraded in a way which I think is a tremendous challenge. There is the massive question of how we affect change 
because be under no illusion about the sheer unmitigated power uh, of the mega corporations of finance uh, in our world today. It is, as I know very well uh, from this place, it is frightening. It is immensely powerful and challenging it is going to be extremely difficult. But to have a vision of the alternative and a clear idea of how things could be different and better is I think the very first step and I think James lecture that we've just heard uh, is precisely that. We're from Occupy London but we don't speak for Occupy London uh, nor are we academic specialists on the Commons. Uh, we're active uh, within the Economics Working Group and the Energy, Equity and Environment Working Group of Occupy London. The Occupy movement which is a global movement as you know has a natural affinity with the ideas of the Commons. And indeed, we've invited specialists uh, to speak uh, in Occupy London and Tent City University at St. Paul's on several occasions. So we're very pleased to have the opportunity to express our interest in it and our relationship to the Commons and explore these issues with you further. Although Occupy came together in response to the crisis in the financial sector, our initial statement on October the 16th, that's the initial statement of Occupy London, apart from stating it refuses to pay for the bank's crisis, already contains within it its commitment not just to a single issue, but its opposition to the way in which society organizes itself currently. For example, uh, in Article 7 of our initial statement, it states that the world's resources must go towards caring for people and the planet, and not the military, corporate profits, or the rich. Because Occupy is not a single issue campaign group, it quite naturally sees the links between socio-economic justice and environmental justice, between which the concept of the commons can provide the unifying concept. I'd like to just describe one or two practical questions about how we create governance bodies for capturing our capital commons, because there's business questions here, and also our land commons for community benefit and also for initiative and enterprise. But I'd first like to celebrate the intellectual and policy leadership of James Quilligan, for which many, many thanks. It's very good to have somebody at your level articulating an overview of what we've been trying to do at the grassroots. And it's essential that we have a partnership of leaders, Michael Nature as well, um, and people working so we can work from a big picture as well as what we're doing locally. Trusts are created to create um, the preservation of these resources well into the future because, because market and government are not geared and they're not created to preserve our resources. That's not their function. They will never do it because that's not their role. At the same time, we're not going to deny the importance of, of markets and governments because they're institutionalized. We're not about to um, tear down the state or abolish business or anything like that. We want to see it all restructured. So the principles are there, but the market and state has created its own dualism. The state kind of representing the uh, um, right brain in the sense that it's, it's dedicated to equality and justice and, and cooperation, at least ideally, and the, um, the right brain uh, being dedicated to free market and, and, and trying to um, uh, bring the cybernetic principles of, of freedom into, um, into private space to say that individual ethic really drives uh, a creative uh, expression and free will. And, and no one wants to deny people's free will. This is part of the liberal ethic that is, is cherished by all of us. And yet, the, the individual and the social are in a, a kind of dichotomy at this point that, that, um, that mimics exactly what the right brain and, and the left brain are doing together. So if, if we conceive of the, the nature of the state being a kind of um, right brain construct and business being a kind of driven by the, the left brain, um, then, then where do we go? Well, we, we need to express this kind of non-dualism through the creation of these trusts because they're the ones that are forward-looking. They're the ones that create the collective intentions of reconciling um, the individual rights and the social good. If we create these trusts and they put a cap on the, the um, um, or a, a new metric 
for the preservation of resources. Then we know how much can be preserved for future generations, and we know how much can be distributed to present generations and to meet human needs. And here's the, the basic principle. Instead of an ownership society, we need to move to a trusteeship society. Because through trusteeship, now the, the trustees rent the goods that are produced to the businesses. And the businesses then extract the resources uh, and uh, are able to sell and, and distribute them for profit. And the taxes that are made off of those the sales of those goods to society. And in other words, business is not going to change that much under this kind of system. The only difference is that there they won't be outright ownership, there will be outright trusteeship. That's a big difference, but still profit uh, motive is, is preserved in this kind of system. And again, this is based on Henry George principles of rent derived through Peter Barnes' Capitalism 3.0. It's a great book. I highly recommend it if you take a look at it. And the work that I'm doing and, and the commons movement is doing is moving in this direction. Uh, the businesses then take the taxes and pay them to government, and the government uses those taxes to replenish the depleted resources and to provide a social dividend for people, uh, particularly those who are uh, displaced by the, the uh, development of the resources, but also a, a, a universal uh, basic income for, for, for people. This is a, a new model, and it's a, it's a trusteeship model rather than an ownership model. This is kind of at the heart of the larger question of how um, the commons can uh, be not so much in competition with corporations, but how the commons are actually going to work in cooperation with co corporations under a new kind of ethic. And that, I think, is a, a trusteeship that we have to create group or collective incentives for sustainability. And that's a different thing altogether. And governments have not even gone in that direction, not in the least. We've got to be able to have uh, a new recognition that it's not just the governments that are going to be driving this process, but it's political accountability structures at different levels of the self-organized resources right down to the very local levels and involving the principle of subsidiarity. People at the lowest levels making the decisions. Because that's really where the commons comes from in the first place. The, the global system needs to imitate the processes of self-governance that people at the local levels are using. The, the, the idea of, of, of what we have as state government now, uh, national constitutions are enshrined mainly to protect the interests of private property. We've kind of got to go back to the original definition of what government means and what governance means in order for the whole thing to be restructured and re-understood. That doesn't mean government needs to be abolished, it just means that it has to be repurposed in many ways. I would say that there are, it, it would seem to me that building these political accountability structures, these trusts, is the, the number one thing that um, we could invest in. And finance needs to be geared toward that. And at the moment, it, it, it's not even on the radar screen. But I, I do know that uh, there's a, a notion of creating commons wealth funds, which uh, would support these trusts. And, I, and a lot of people have thought that this is a, a very good um, uh, development. And there is work being done on it now. But it's, it's very much in the early stages. Um, and in terms of investments, I, I would just remind everyone that a lot of people who can campaign for uh, green kinds of policies, um, their pension funds are actually being taken and putting into fossil fuel policies because that's where the biggest return of investment is. Yeah. And so the problem is that, that we're, we're still div divided by the system because we, it's, it's kind of a, a catch-22 or it's a no-win kind of situation. Uh, we want to be able to liberate our capital to do good things, but yet it's, it's hijacked. And yes. again, coming back to it, why is it hijacked? Well, because of the power structure, but also because of interest rates. We, we, all of us want to get a, a, the best return on investment, and therefore we're, we're supportive of the pension funds investing in the, in, for 30 years out, you know, or amortizing for 20 years out, or long-term investments to tie up our funds so that we're sure that we're getting the, the maximum return, and yet it's not necessarily what's in our hearts to do because we know where that's, a lot of that money's going. It's going into 
um, into you know long-term commits, commitments to fossil fuel industries. So it's it's um, it's something that we're not going to be able to turn around quickly. And it's one of the reasons why I say if we're following market prices and we're hoping that just by uh, you know, increasing the cost of petrol, and that's going to solve the global warming. We're, we're absolutely dreaming to think that because the institutional um, leveraging, uh, based on the interest rates uh, and the, and the whole philosophy that we've bought into, because we want to get the maximum return on investment, is really cl crippling our abilities to create these um, group or collective intentions for sustainability. Yes, there's an awful optimism in, in that area, but there's also a lot of darkness in the way that people are selfish. And I think how do we tackle that sense of spirituality that's out there, endemic in people, in human nature, to move it towards a way that emphasizes more this cooperative nature that we all agree should be possible, and yet prevent the structure of those in control, you know, preventing that from happening. So how can we move that forward in a practical way and make people more aware? That makes sense. Could, could I just say that we can already create common wealth funds through community benefit societies, the Industrial and Providence Society model. So our cooperative movement does allow us to do that. And we're creating common wealth funds for securing the capital commons, it's a Midlands project, and also for land and for community re reinvestment in public assets. We can do that. We've got the legislation and the legal frameworks to do that. And we can bypass the banks, who take a big cut, and that solves the interest rate via crowdsourcing. Um, Fort Hall Farm in 2006 was the only community buyout that year. 8,500 people, 800,000 pounds. In 2010, there were 45, and Cooperatives UK have, have developed the tools and structures to do that. So that's a, a big invitation. I've got some questions to James. Um, firstly, it's a huge idea that trusteeship bodies own our natural assets. London, for example, water is owned by the Chinese, and, and I think Northumbrian water as well. So we need to reclaim our commons and put them into trusteeship. And that's you know, inviting the policy-making process to do that. So that's a, a fantastic idea. And leasing those assets is fantastic. And I think behind this whole trusteeship uh, set of values is indeed the original Community Benefit Society designed by John Stuart Mill. It was called an Industrial and Provident Society to marry community benefit and individual initiative. Mm -hmm. So we're in that tradition, and Letchworth Garden City is. But my questions to you are... Um, there's a huge amount of good practice globally, wherever. How, yeah, what research agenda is needed? You know, what research agenda is needed? And part of that research agenda is what action research is needed to evaluate existing good practice to learn what to keep, what to drop, what to create, mm -hmm. um, and what models then need, you know, prototyping to learn from that and for dissemination. And, and the third question, or the second question, is what policy development is needed to make life easy for our legislators, you know, to have, have a good set of policies for them to adopt, like Yvette Cooper obviously didn't understand community land trusteeships and affordable housing when went to see her as the housing minister. You know, her, her brain's full up with stuff. So we need policy development. So what policy development is needed and what and it, what are the key leverage points for that? You know, what with a minimum input would create the maximum um, benefits in terms of shifting the commons agenda mm -hmm. further? And, and just a, I've got a rider about business. A lot of business people are really keen on this agenda. A lot of government people are. And we need to invite partnerships between civil society, government and business. We can't we can't create enemies of government and business. There are potential partners. It seems to me that the evolution of consciousness that we're talking about is new light displacing old light. That's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about materiality so much because if we put our minds on materiality, we end up with the mind-body split. and we've, We're done with that. We're moving into something different. The new light is replacing the old light. 
And the old light is being captured by the institutions and the societies which um, have made, um, have generated value out of the old, what was at one point the new light, but now they've become crystallized and the new light is coming in, the new evolutionary impulses are coming in. As we move deeper into the 21st century, we're really gonna have to take seriously the idea of, of public banking and to, to recognize that it's not just these trusts that are important, it's the issuance of a new value from these trusts in a new way, which is debt-free. One of the problems with the trusteeships is that, um, as you know, anybody who's tried to create alternative currencies, uh, the alternative currencies are always very locally based, which is the whole purpose of them, and yet, um, you know, they express what economists call um, a, a, a unit of exchange and a store of value, but they don't express a standard of value. A value standard is not implicit in any of these alternative currencies. The alternative currency movement hasn't been linked up yet to the commons, and that's the origin of public banking that we're so desperately uh, craving at this point. And the reason why this is important, if we had a standard of value that expressed the uh, the value of the commons in a composite way, then these alternative currencies could link up to that. But the alternative currencies, as they exist now, end up linking to the national currencies in many cases, or or time hours, you know, which which is legitimate in some way, but it's it's not sustainable. That that won't work moving forward. If we look at economic history, um, economists. Uh, and historians of the economics will always tell you that, that the currency is linked to some kind of resource. And we, we know that from our history, but in, beginning in 1971, when the United States took the world off the gold standard, we've gone to this notion that it's all about fiat currencies. We went from fixed exchange rates to floating exchange rates at the global level. And in doing so, the rationale for that was that the United States was still the, the world's currency hegemon, but the, the thing is that the value of U.S. currency was based in faith in the United States government. It wasn't. It was really in a de facto way based on oil supplies in the Middle East, which the, the United States guaranteed by uh, having military uh, protection for the pipelines and shipping lanes and oil fields of, of the OPEC nations, or at least most of the OPEC nations. And what we've, what we've got now is a situation where there's denial that it's productivity based on oil that is underpinning the value of the United States currency and by extension the rest of the world's currencies because many, it's the hegemon of monetary policy and, and many countries linked to it and, and also many countries uh, collect US dollars to keep in their vaults as though it was gold and then uh, the value has to come back to the United States, the dollars come back to the United States and it's repatri repatriated in value, which has created the, the long-lasting nature of the prosperity in the United States until very recently. That has to end, and that will end. It's, it's, it's going to end because of the marketplace. The marketplace will require that to end because investors at some point will get uh, very af afraid of their investments in the United States. It will be part of the precipitation of the crisis that, that is looming. We need to have the answers on plan B to, to go into the monetary discussions at the international level where Great Britain and the United States and China and other countries are going to have a Bretton Woods level conference talking about monetary policy. And we've got to be able to show them that the commons are the basis for a new monetary system. That's the last point I wanted to make. How do we get to the trusteeship? We do it by coming together and creating the social charter because it's the social charter that creates the declaration among all of us that we thrashed out over long discussions in terms of what our rights are, what our responsibilities are, what our historic perspective on these commons are, how they've been removed from our um, oversight, how, what steps that we suggest to, to be taken to get to that level. Because in order to set up a legal and fiduciary institution called a trust, we need to have a very good rationale or business plan going into the creation of the trust. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Well. <laughs>
challenged by such radicalism that I can ever remember. Um, and a radicalism which is not just purely fantasy, but which is tied down with quite specific concepts, but which is going to be very difficult uh, actually to bring about, but which in another sense is probably in the medium long term, I expect James agrees with this, inevitable. Because I don't think the world can go on in the way <coughs> that it is. But going from a privatization ownership society to a trusteeship common space society is uh, an enormous shift, a huge culture shift, as was said in the discussion. And these things don't occur uh, in a revolutionary way. Um, they are evolutionary. And it is as a result of the combination of a whole series of apparently unconnected but actually quite closely connected movements taking place across the world. Uh, even if they lead to big ones like the renegotiation of Bretton Woods, uh, which I think is, uh, is something that is going to happen, uh, the World Bank and WTO and IMF um, are, do not serve our world at the present time. And it is this sort of concept, this sort of vision, which needs to feed into uh, that uh, top level international politicizing. Anyway, I, I thought that was wonderful. I've learned a huge amount. Uh, and it's one of those occasions when I just feel we're just starting. We've only had two and a half hours. Um, what about the next two and a half? Because I think we could continue. But there are going to be 12 lectures. And as James has said, the last two are specifically concentrating on how we get from here to there. Somebody said to me in the midst of a discussion about the immensity of the task, there are no solutions, only ways of living that enable us to cradle new life while surviving old death. That's our situation now, and we are moving on. What we've designed in this, and I hope you'll implant it in the forefront of your mind as a model, we are trying to create a prototype of drawing together many people concerned with these things to find their common ground, to become part of a critical mass. Because over those 40 odd years I've been working in London, I've been appalled at brilliant ideas isolated because the person or group of that idea speak only of that idea. They don't speak of wholeness. They don't speak of interaction. They don't learn and criticize. I'm being generalized, of course. But in general truth, it frightens me. And so this is a bold attempt, and there are 10 more seminars. Uh, one or two are full now, um, but one will deal with spirituality on Sunday afternoon uh, in St. James Piccadilly, plenty of room there. Um, one will deal with trusteeship and business models with Esther and Susan um, and so on. The New Economics Foundation has one. So this is the beginning of trying to come at this common ground from different angles. And if we create a model, take that model, build on it, make it suitable to other situations. We'll see it happening as it already is in Stroud. Wonderful model there, worth looking at in depth for the whole community involvement. So there we are in the midst of a very important thing. But it does require a number of things, like high tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> because you bring together different groups, maybe saying the same thing, but their vocabulary divides you. We have to be very sensitive to that. We also have to throw out all dogma, but take it back as poetry. Sometimes people dismiss dogma, and lose the fact that the original idea was of enormous enduring wisdom. And it's just got distorted by being dogmatized. Uh, and the last one is to hold your convictions tentatively. That's a very important paradox to get hold of. Because we get wrapped up in our convictions and we forget to cross the boundaries. <laughs>